Ski media is more vibrant and varied than it has ever been. And, and there are opportunities for people to find, you know, to find their crew. This episode of the Backcountry Podcast is brought to you by the Vermont Department of Tourism. Winter is here and there are few places better for adventure than Vermont. Iconic ski areas, lift access side country, and of course, backcountry opportunities up and down the spine of the Green Mountains. And after a long day outside, cozy inns, craft beer, and farm to table dinners await. But things are not normal and planning is key. There are steps you must take before you can travel to the state. While Vermont is open for business, visitors must quarantine for 14 days or seven days with a negative COVID test. Planning is part of most ski vacations or weekends away, but this year planning is imperative to keep yourself and Vermonters safe. At resorts, lifts and lodges have limited capacity and some are requiring reservations for parking. Many hotels, inns, and restaurants are operating with limitations in place as well, so knowing the rules before you go is key. Again, Vermont is open for business and ready to offer you world-class winter experiences and adventures. It will just take a little extra planning this year to do it right and help us all stop the spread of COVID-19. Check out vermontvacation.com for the most up-to-date travel restrictions. Welcome to the Backcountry Podcast. I'm Adam Howard. Among the many disruptions in 2020, perhaps the one which stuck out the most to the backcountry and greater skiing community was the closure in November of Powder Magazine and its sister titles, Bike, Surfer, and Snowboarder. Over the past several years, we've also witnessed the loss of the Transworld titles and Skiing Magazine, too. On the flip side, there's a forward-thinking Colorado company called Pocket Outdoor Media, which is pulling together a large swath of the outdoor media. It promises to create a new model combining digital, print, events, and training plans into a massive AI-driven ecosystem. Pocket is well-funded and led by an impressive team, and now owns Warren Miller, Ski, Climbing, and many, many others. Then there's the little guys like Backcountry Magazine and its sister publications Alpinist, Cross Country Skier, and Mountain Flyer. Add to them brands like Adventure Journal, Ski Journal, Free Skier, and a host of others, making it happen every day. We're all small and independent and weathering the COVID storm and emerging media landscape the best we can. And it's become more like tending a garden, really, than running a business. We're praying for rain, metaphorically speaking. And frankly, it's working, which makes the demise of powder that much harder to understand. We're calling this episode The Future of Ski Media, whatever that means. And I've asked longtime powder editor-in-chief Steve Casimiro to talk about his project, The Adventure Journal. The AJ is a coffee table style quarterly, and it has evolved to stay increasingly relevant in the world of Instagram doom scrolling and YouTube sessioning. Mike Rogie has worked all over the place, including at Powder and Ski Journal. Over the past eight years, he's focused largely on video with his company Verb Cabin. You might have seen the new Westward series he's developed with our friends at Flylo. In the spring, he bought the assets of the long, mothballed, and legendary title Mountain Gazette. The first issue came out this autumn, and it's a stirring tribute to the values on which the brand was first created back in the 60s. Finally, we have pro skier and filmmaker Ingrid Backstrom. Like myself, Ingrid was an intern at Powder early in her career, and has written for the brand over the years many times. Unlike Casimiro, Rogi, and me, her most notable work is skiing Incredible Lines for Matchstick Productions, and more recently, she's produced a ton of independent ski films, in addition to her regular avalanche education work. Like the Prince-centric ski brands, film as we know it from Warren Miller, TGR, Matchstick, Poor Boys, is all under threat. So what's this all mean? Where do we go from here? Nobody knows, but if you do, please give me a call. In the meantime, we'll start with these three creators who've dedicated a great deal of their lives to the sport we love. Thank you all for joining me. So Steve, I'd like to start with you since you were, uh, you know, you started at Powder in the, in the late 80s and, and stayed there through the late 90s. What is ski media today, and, and what do you think it looks like in the future? I, I had a feeling you were going to start with me. <laughs> um, boy, you know, I, I, I don't think any of us honestly know. I mean, I'm curious, Ingrid and, and Mike, to hear what you guys have to say. I mean, I think part of the problem is, or, or part of the issue, is that things are so dynamic that it's about the only thing that we can predict is that it's really going to change. A couple of things are changing here, a couple of big things that were in place for so many years and um, relatively stable. And those are the ability for people, for brands to reach their potential customers in all kinds of new ways that are typically way more efficient than print media. Um, And that customers, excuse me, consumers have so many more choices 
24 seven to access this stuff. So like when I was a powder, we didn't have to worry about any of that, you know, like there was uh, ski skiing and powder and the ski magazines came out a few times a year. And so now your challenges are just so completely different. And so I, I don't think that there are going to be really cut and dried answers for any ski media. I think that there's always going to be this challenge of, you know, how much is digital and what form is it? You know, how much do we put into video? How much do we put into words? Um, I don't think it's going to get any easier. I think it's only going to get harder. So if it's going to only get harder, why would someone, you know, relaunch a legacy title like this one right here, Mountain Mountain Gazette? Mike, why would you do such a thing? So I've been accused of doing this a little too much, but I, I think of um, media consumption like a diet, <laughs> like, if, like, you know, how you consume food, right? I think that for the long road trip when the only thing you can see are those golden arches and it's the only food you've seen for 300 miles like mcdonald's might sound pretty good uh for me and mountain gazette i thought that i am very proud to say and i'm not just blowing smoke up his ass i've been an adventure journal subscriber since issue one i have every single copy um i thought with mountain gazette that i could not do like a, a me too with what adventure journal is doing. I thought I could kind of give my own take on what I think outdoor is. Um, and I thought there was room for it. And, and I mean, I know Steve has said this to some of his subscribers and at least we've talked about it privately is like when someone asks like adventure journal or mountain gazette, I always say both, but I wanted to go with the, to this future of, um, ski media is, um, there is a skier who just got picked up by Atomic, and her name is Kaylee Palmer. And if you've never heard of Kaylee Palmer, it's okay. But she has 1.3 million views on TikTok, and she's really, really funny. And she's the only person I follow on TikTok because I think she's the only one who does it correctly. Um, I posted a video of like a mogul skiing event from Killington and got like 300 likes. But I think with this media diet is that I like getting adventure journal. I'm really excited that Reddick has the cover of the new one, Steve. That's just for me as like, you know, I came of age and that, uh, you know, your powder and Carlson's powder is like my powder, if you will. Like we all have our generation, right? I want to see AJ four times a year with mountain Gazette, that format. I think people only need it twice a year. If they want more of it, that's fine. But I think twice a year is really nice. Um, Kaylee Palmer posts like three times a day. So I only log into TikTok like once a week and I kind of like catch up. And I guarantee that's not what TikTok was intending for like a 35 year old male skier to like how they're just gonna engage in it. But I think the future of ski media is kind of like your favorite diner in that they're gonna, we're gonna serve a lot of different food and some of it's gonna be good and some of it's gonna be bad, but you can find your crew. Whereas like before, I mean, I always say like, I was really fortunate. I was in middle school when Solomon started turning up tails and the 1080 came about and all I had was freeze magazine powder axis and then newscores.com came along and that at that time didn't even seem like enough, especially when everything was changing. You know, Shane McConkie would go to Alaska and ski on water skis and the whole sport would change. And I had to wait to find out. Now you don't have to wait. Henry Carlo can do a new trick today in Andorra. And you know, and so if that's your brand of ski media, it's there for you. That's not my brand of ski media anymore. My brand of ski media is Joe Sagona on the cover of AJ. And just like, I, I've looked at that cover a bunch of times, Steve. I'm just like, yeah, it makes me feel good. <laughs> um, you know, so I think really like what, the only thing that really scares me the most, I think magazines are doing okay. Like I really, even though powder just went down, I think like, um, Steve, I hope you, I mean, it seems like you guys are doing okay. And how I think you guys are doing okay. Like I'm more worried about the ski movie. It feels like the ski movie is becoming extinct. I don't see a lot of young kids being like, I want to, you know, go make the next great ski film. But, right. um, the mountain gazette, I just thought, I don't know. I thought there was space for it. Well, Ingrid, let's, let's riff off that a little bit. You know, we talk about our brand of ski media. What's yours today and, and how has it changed over the last decade for you? Gosh, that's such a hard question. I mean, I still love to hold a magazine in my hand and read it, but at the same time, with everyone's so busy, you know, and when you have little kids, you just have to 
like Mike said, you're getting little snacks of what you can see, which um, unfortunately for me, it drives me nuts most of the time, but it's on Instagram and I don't check in that often. But if it's during the winter, you know, I would check powder, I'd check TGR just to see what was going on. Um, but that's just because I had five minutes or two minutes or one minute to check and see what's going on. But yeah, I still love to hold a magazine in my hand. And so I think it's, yeah, it's sad that the institutions that have been around for so long that we could count on that reached a broad audience that someone yeah. could decide that. But then luckily we have other amazing publications that can find their niche. You don't have to, I think that's one of the great things about it. The flip side is that people can find their niche and you don't have to ap- appeal to every single powder fan out there. You can find your niche. Uh, you know, there's people doing newsletters, there's blogs, there's web, there's so many different forms to, and there's beautiful print magazines coming out. Yeah, I mean, um, I think both of you guys hit on really key points. And, you know, Howie, when you kick off by talking about Ski Media, I mean, I'm coming from a perspective of of thinking about Ski Media as as a a publication company. But I mean, Ski Media, everybody is a member of the Ski Media who's putting their own stuff on social, right? Kaylee, I'm sorry, if if that was her name, like Kaylee, you know, like that's Ski Media, you know, the gram is, that's ski media. I mean, these are all forms of ski media. And, you know, the movies are going away. They're going to, they're going to pop up someplace else from just people in their backyards or whatever doing it. I mean, those, that's all ski media. So, you know, in terms of like guardrails for the conversation, at least for me, I'm, I'm thinking about publishing companies, you know, as I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about like a commercial operation because ski media is more vibrant and varied than it has ever been. And, and there are opportunities for people to find, you know, to find their crew. I mean, that's not too hard. There's, it's, you know, it feels like it's an infinite number of choices. But if you're coming from the perspective of a publisher, like all of us are, you know, that's an entirely different thing. And I think that we, we have to look at this kind of context as we're thinking about like our editorial products. And I think we also have to think, invest a lot of time in thinking about who our audience is and what they want and what they want from us. And I think one of the mistakes or not it's a mistake, but it's certainly a challenge is if you're a corporately owned semi-enthusiast publication, you're expected to you know check off all the boxes from social to video yeah. to newsletters. You're supposed to do all of those things. And one of the things that's been really hard with, with doing AJ is these temptations to go and, do a podcast because that's where the money is. And I would love to do that or to do this over here. And, you know, we, we've actually just been having conversations the last couple of days about the importance of saying no and just doing what we do really well and not, as our dev guy says, chasing squirrels, you know? And I think that that's, that's one of the big challenges that we're, we're all going to face because like, well, I just created a TikTok, you know, account for AJ. <laughs> We're not going to be a ticket. Come on, right. <laughs> you know. But I felt like I kind of felt like for a week, like I needed to, and so it's it's staying focused. And I think that you know, like Mountain Gazette or AJ or you know these things, like you know, less is more, and being co- comfortable with like doing this one product. And if you can figure out, if you can figure out the spreadsheets, you know, if you figure out the balance sheet to make it pay for itself, then just do that. When I worked at Powder, we had the hard good guides, the soft good guides, the accessory guide, Powder Awards, Powder Week, um, the you know Powder Readers Poll, which was different than like Skier of the Year, something like just Powder. Like ev- we had everything that it got to a point where it was like, shouldn't the photo annual matter the most? <laughs> like, isn't that why it's Powder Magazine? Like, shouldn't you care about that the most? And I I don't know. We just were never given that opportunity to do that in that corporate structure we were always you know what is the online buyer's guide going to look like or ski town throwdown which is like my you know horrible mess that ruined facebook for everyone because we got every ski town fighting over who was better that thing made less money than one issue of the magazine but it was seen as a success because it had a lot of social engagement so i think it's all about like what your priorities are as a, a media company for me i i say it all the time i just want to make a magazine that people like that's it. I just want to make something that comes to your door twice a year that you really, really enjoy. And if I accomplish well, that, then I'm good. Can a high quality uh, enthusiast magazine be financially successful under corporate ownership or does it have to be independent? I mean, how I, I certainly 
you know, I'd like to hear your perspective on that. I feel that, you know, any one of us could have made powder successful. Powder is successful. It could have easily stayed successful. And so same with bike or surfer. I do think if print, com if print is a big part of your program, it's got to be done with, with love from the very top. If, if there's a digital answer that's not Instagram or whatever, then maybe there's a different answer. But I want to get Ingrid in here because I'd like to, there, Steve, when you started out earlier, what I thought of was how at one point on the editorial side, we were the gatekeepers. Every athlete had to go through us. Every advertiser had to go through us. And we were the access point to the audience. That, of course, is no longer the case. And Ingrid, I'd like to ask you, from an athlete's perspective, you've been at it long enough that you've kind of, and I know your career has changed and you're doing many different things now, but from an athlete's perspective, when you are creating all your own content now, certainly print is not, you're not like, yeah, you, you covet a cover photo, for instance, or a profile, but, but you're not knocking at the door all the time. Give me your perspective on that dynamic. I think it's great because there can be all types of skiers before if you were a young female skier, for example, and you maybe didn't identify with the few female skiers that were professional, maybe you'd probably look elsewhere for inspiration. But now you can look at such a wide variety of women skiers to find your inspiration and say, you know what, I want to be like her. Or, and it's the same for men too. And so I think that in a way that's really opened it up to people. But at the same time, there, there's no editing. So you end up having to sift through all that on your own and figure out where it is. So it's a lot harder for people to break in and get past all the noise. You used and to it, just be able to speak with your skiing. That was really all that mattered. Yeah, exactly. You used to just be, okay, my matchstick segment came out. That was it. Cool. That's what I spent my whole winter working on. And now it's like, okay, great. Do I need to be showing my training videos? Do I need to be showing my kids? Do I need to be showing my, like, what kind of, uh, who, what kind of skier are you going to be? And I think, it, like you said, it's all about just staying true to yourself and being who you are. And if the audience is there, great. And if not, then I got to find something else to do because I'm, whenever I've tried to not be myself or do something that doesn't feel like me, it just falls flat. And that's not a good feeling. Um, for anyone, anyone that's watching or anyone that's doing it. So how much time do you spend on social media, like creating content? I'm super lucky in that I already had a career established by the time social media came along. So I already had a little bit of that platform um, and that audience kind of just was there. So I don't actually think of it in terms of like creating content. I just go skiing. And if we pull out that phone and get a couple great photos, that's sweet. Um, but yeah, now more I'm thinking about projects in terms of what I want to do this winter, who I want to work with, who I want to help lift up and help give a voice to and get out there and work with. And I think there's a lot more freedom of, hey, what do I want to watch? I could just go out and make that instead of having to wait and be like, oh, there's not the kind of thing that I want to watch out there or what I, who I want to see skiing. Maybe we could just go make that. beyond anything ski related, beyond anything magazine related, I think my biggest fear for the future of any of this media is reading. And when you when your children become school age, you, you will see how frankly little value is placed on on those simple things. Reading and writing and even keyboarding is becoming much less important in society. And so um, for me who who kind of consumes you know, stories through, through words and tells them through words, it's, it's a little hard to palate. And that's, I think, a bigger concern than worrying about advertising, worrying about, you know, the size of our subscribership or the age of them, et cetera. That's, that's like a key thing. And I don't know how you can, I don't know how you can affect any change there from our level. Steve, it, you and I have talked about this before. Are you, are you similarly concerned or, or, or more, more hopeful. Well, I wasn't until you put it that way. <laughs> oh, man. I, I was hoping not to get here. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Thanks. You just brought us right down. Did you? you were just waiting for that. Um, as Ingrid was talking, and I was, I was 
you know, the ability to like create what you don't see, create for yourself, which is incredible. But I think one of the things that I see and why I, I have to keep my social consumption, you know, pretty low is because I just get numb to the superficiality of it. And I, I was thinking about, is, is, Ingrid, as you were talking, I was thinking about the difference between, for lack of a better way of putting it, I was thinking about a, a spectrum of quality in terms of our storytelling and the presentation, whatever form that may be, from words to photos to film. And I was kind of thinking about this as a construct of like the, the very sort of thin, superficial nature of most social media versus at least theoretically, the highly edited, highly produced, great consideration that goes into something that you put into print or, you know, a big, relatively big budget movie. And I was, so I was kind of thinking how in, it's like in, very similar in terms of like, how much appetite is there for, obviously there's a huge appetite for the easy access, free and superficial. How much appetite is there for when you really invest the time to create something that's nuanced, and thoughtful and beautiful and stands the test of time. And there's, there's visual, which is, you know, of the not reading and that's kind of the superficial. And then there's the investment of reading. And it, are we basically, if we're trying to do Alpinist and Backcountry and AJ and Mountain Gazette, are we fundamentally only creating magazines for old people is what I was thinking. You know, the people who actually have the appreciation for the energy that goes into that kind of creation, or are we going to see younger people kind of coming around? I mean, that's one of the things I think about a lot. Is this like a fundamental human shift in how we consume information that pushes out the old school printed on, you know, on paper, or are we going to be able to, if we can find those sustainable, successful models um, to do it, will they be able to exist side by side? And you asked, how do I define successful? It's being financially sustainable. Like, can you create a model in which you can do what you're doing without dramatic change and make a living at it? You know, none of us are going to get rich, but can we do it without like one day just self-combusting? So, so Howie, I'm, I'm here to be your, your hope. Um, <laughs> there's a, a Greg Wright, who is a friend of ours, used to be the publisher over at Free Skier Magazine is teaching at a private school here in Tahoe called Tahoe Expedition Academy. And after I picked up the Gazette, he called me and was like, hey, we have a journalism class. I actually want to turn it into a Mountain Gazette outdoor journalism class. I'm like, okay, I don't feel qualified to teach that, but let's give it a try. Um, one of the stories that's in there on day one, the school's all about like overcoming adversity and you know being able to like find a challenge and overcome it. Um, on day one, they got to pitch me for the first issue. And I saved a spot for him. And there's a story in there called What a Weird Summer that was written by a 14-year-old from Truckee. And his story was great. His pitch was really simple. It said, my mom's not a bitch, but she's being one. And I thought, holy shit. I don't even know this kid. Why? Where is he going with this? His mom and dad um, have two kids. You know, He's got a little sister. And she's immunocompromised. And they can't leave the house. They both work corporate jobs. They're on the computer all day. He has been relegated in COVID he's a really big mountain biker to watching his younger sister. And so he did not have access to the mountain bike trails that he loves here in North Lake Tahoe because his mom couldn't drive him there. So he did something that he kind of regrets. He started building his own trails on uh, public land near his house. And he knows it wasn't the right thing to do, but it was all he could do. And I found that story to be incredibly compelling. And I think that story doesn't work great on an Instagram feed. And I don't think it works well as a movie shot in a GoPro. I think it worked really well in the Gazette. And then we surprised him when bike shut down. I texted Grant Gunderson and said, send me your bike submission. And so this 14 year old kid has photos accompanied by Grant Gunderson that we're going to run the bike photo annual. And he's stoked. Now the yeah. best part is he's not only stoked because he got published and we paid him and the whole deal. He's stoked because there's 14 other kids in the class that had good pitches, including David Page's son, Jasper, who goes to school in Mammoth. They all had great pitches, but this one fit for what we wanted. So now I have this next issue coming up and I have pitches from all 14 of these kids. And I keep thinking, 
you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give them your email, Adam, and I'm going to give them your email, Steve. And I told them the goal of this class is not that I'm creating the farm team for Mountain Gazette. It's that I get really upset when one of my students becomes the editor of Backcountry or starts interning for Steve or is pitching Ingrid on like making a film that they wrote. And so I know it's only 14 kids, but we're teaching it again. I'd love to have you guys come into the class if you want to. Um, I won't put you on the spot, but like they just want to know everything about what it is because what they think is cool is that the Instagram video that they posted last night, it's old news. But the magazine that Lyle's in is still on their coffee table. It's still there. And they see that and they understand that if they want to have a real impact, they need some longevity. And I just don't think you get that being funny on Instagram a couple times a week. I actually did a Zoom talk last night with what I think may be the only uh, comprehensive adventure storytelling class in the country. It's at Southern Oregon University. This great dude, Chad Thatcher, is a professor, and um, it's focused on words, photography, and film. So it's, it's and I've talked to a lot of classes, and these guys were so prepared. They had such amazing questions, and they were so invested in it. And we had time at the end where I got to ask them, like, well, why are you doing this? Why are you in this class? And there are a couple of master's folks, and, you know, they had, like, all, their answers were all over the place, but some people were just really, they were all really invested in their relationship with the outdoors and wanting to be able to communicate that better. Um, and some of them were young, you know, some of them were 22 or 23 and some were in their thirties. So, you know, I, I guess it's risky to look at, to make these leaps, which you kind of can't help but do it. But like, when you look at your experiences around you or, you know, when my daughter was in high school, she wasn't really reading that much. And she reads like five books a week now, you know, at age 20. So, I think that we just in some way have to keep doing what we're doing and try to find our audiences as best we can and, and have some faith that they're going to, that our products are going to find the right people. Yeah. And I mean, admittedly, I mean, Ingrid, I'm sure you would agree with this too. Like um, my son is two. I don't have that much time to sit down <laughs> and read AJ, you know, front to back the way I used to, but that's why I keep them because they're here. And I think that's where, the model that we're com- you know, we're all playing with is that you might miss stuff online. That's just part of being a good parent. You're supposed to miss stuff online. You're supposed to miss all this breaking news that you were so obsessed with. I mean, there was a time in my life where if someone 270 would off a rail, I could hear them landing. Like I just knew what was happening in the ski world. And now it's like, I need to catch up on my last issue of AJ before the new one comes. And I'll read a story here or there and it, it's nice. And like, you know, Blevins today from the Colorado Sun was saying like, he's reading his Mountain Gazette. He's reading one feature a night for the next month. And I'm like, what a weird way to read a magazine, but that's how he wants to enjoy it. I think that's it. It's like, there's appetites for this. You know, there really are. And if we don't see them, maybe it is an age thing, but here's the nice thing is no one stays young forever and no one stays old forever. We started off by talking at powder and and I, I I gotta say that I've had I've really struggled with this and I haven't really said anything myself like a lot of us have written little pieces um, about the powder demise temporary as it may be hopefully but uh, it's it's been a gut punch because as someone who for years has been a distant number two or three or four depending on the category and I'm talking about backcountry magazine of course. It's been it's been easy because the pressure wasn't there. Now we're like, now it's like us and ski and and free skier and and ski journal and and the landscape just seems very very strange. And and I really struggle with processing it. And I wonder, you know, it's a little different for I think the emotional attachment that we each have to that brand certainly resonates. I'm sure with you all. But Steve and Mike, from the magazine publisher side of you, how does it sit? It's a little bit aside uh, apart from from the more general interest stuff not to call it general interest but multi-sport i'll call it that you guys are covering how does it how does it sit with you as far as the landscape is concerned in the ski media world i think sometimes what happens is social pressures kind of force publishers to make decisions like steve you said joining tiktok like i've been thinking the same thing should mountain gazette be on tiktok you know like and i think powder um felt they needed to 
um, address certain social issues. I know like with Porter Fox, they went really deep into climate change when I was there and the Stevens Pass avalanche happened. I mean, John Stifter and I got together after all that settled down and John Branch was writing Snowfall for the New York Times. And we were like, we, we owe it to our readers to do this. But I think the problem was that we sort of like, I felt towards the end of my time at Powder that we were losing what made Powder Powder. And that's not a criticism of the editors. I think that like, that's just sort of like how media can go sometimes is you sort of lose your, you lose your lead. And that can be tough to sell, you know, like that can be, and from a publisher standpoint, I think that can be tough to sell the advertisers, it can be tough to sell the readers. My biggest fear with Mountain Gazette was that like John Fahey is like a Colorado legend and people love John Fahey. And the number one question I got when I brought back the Gazette was what's Fahey going to be doing? Is this Fahey? Like people would send us, is this John Fahey? And like Fahey didn't want anything to do with it. He wrote a feature. He didn't want, he's past it. You know, I actually, I will say this. I've never told him this publicly. Um, I found out from the jaded local that powder was going under about five or six days before I think Annie Fast broke the news on Twitter. Um, Hans called me. I was at a, um, a brewery uh, outside having a beer and I hadn't talked to him in like two or three years. And he's like, it's over. He's like, it's not public, but it's over. And I didn't believe him because he's the J of local. Like he's been saying it's over for like 20 years. <laughs> I think we all probably feel this way too. Like, um, you know, Derek Taylor hired me. And I can say that, like, I had a life that I was living in Burlington, Vermont before DT hired me. And I have, I mean, here in my home with my wife and son in Lake Tahoe, where I live now because of powder. So powder certainly transformed my life. And so I thought about Derek, who hasn't been there for years. And I thought about um, Reddick. I think we all probably did because ultimately, while Jake and Dave founded it, I, I do feel like Dave was the Dave was the soul of that magazine. And so I just thought about the people. It's always been about people in publishing. DT said something really great to me in a text. He's like, you know, powder was just holding up a mirror to the reflection of the culture. And just because the mirror's gone doesn't mean the culture's gone. And I've been thinking about that a lot, is that the culture's still out there, even if powder's not, you know? That's true, Mike. But I mean, I agree with everything you said, except I would just add that it is absolutely a mirror, but it also then gets refracted through the perspective of the people who are holding that up. And so at its best, a magazine can take these elements that it sees throughout the culture and bring them together and collate them or reshape them or recommunicate them in a way that magnifies and perhaps redirects what's going on. And I mean, I think this is one of the reasons why powder, you know, I mean, Publishing is like sailing, right? You go this way for a while and you go that way for a while. It's not a direct line. You're always kind of thinking about, you're looking at the broader trends in society. You're thinking about the changes in the sport. You're thinking about the changes in your readers and you know new people come into the editor's helm. And so there's always gonna be a little bit of that at some point. But I think that one of the, the beauties of a well-done publication is that it can then be it can also be a leader within the culture, not just reflecting what's going on in the culture. So that for me is one of the, the saddest things when a publication goes away. Um, it's that you've lost an opportunity for a certain perspective on the world. I was heartbroken when NGA went under National Geographic Adventure, even though you know I saw the writing on the wall for at least a year because I felt like um, one, it, it was striving for a level of excellence excellence that is rare in outdoor books, but it also offered a very alternative um, and important voice to what outside was doing, you know, and now they're gone and outside is there. And so we have like one large general interest outdoor book, which is kind of driving a lot of the, or at least has been driving a lot of, um, taking up a lot of the oxygen in the room. So when a publication goes away, I mean, it, it, it doesn't just take away that reflection, it changes, it can remove a leader, which I think is really important. You know, my response to it is, you know, because I'm very close to Reddick and um, and I, I mean, I hired the guy for crying out loud, you know, like I love him. And, um, you know, so my thoughts have always gone to him and to, you know, the other people that were connected to it, to the Mo's, you know, to Dave. And But one of the things that's changed for me in my evolution from magazine staffer to a freelancer to, geez, a small business owner and a manufacturer is it kind of hammers out 
a lot of your naivete or idealism about how businesses run and need to run to be successful, to be financially successful. And it, as we all know, it's just so incredibly Darwinian. You know, if you don't have your audience and if you don't give them a product that they can't get anywhere else, a good value, they're not going to be there and you're not going to make it. And Powder wasn't able to do that. And it wasn't able to do that, I think, in, to a great extent because of the ownership structure. You know, I felt like Powder's fate was sealed, you know, when, when it got sold from FBLI to Peterson. You know, like we, it was, we had such a benign ownership structure in the 11 or so years that I was there. And the die was cast after that because corporations don't generally really understand that. So um, there's a part of me that's like, oh, well, they didn't make it. That's a bummer. The business part of me is like, well, that's unfortunate. On the other hand, I'm, I'm so incredibly, AJ wouldn't exist if I weren't really idealistic about the power, the potential for publications to reach audiences and to make a profound difference in people's lives. And Powder did that for so long. And so... I really believe that in one form or another, something is going to spring out that will carry that spirit forward. I don't know if it's going to have the name powder or if it's going to be something else, but I do think that there is a spirit there around that perspective on skiing that um, that isn't going to go away. It, we just need somebody, and you know, I think there are enough people out there with money and interest to want to keep that flame alive, whether they're able to do that or not, I don't know, but I do think that potential is there for it. And so it's not like... Um, like a pink bike perspective on, on, on yeah. cycling, you know, it's really different from that. I think it's, you know, we talk a lot about soul of sports, right. And I mean, this is a case where, you know, powder really did embody the soul of a ter of a certain form of skiing. And so that's not going to go away because powder does. And as long as that's there, that's going to be offered the opportunity for some publication to convey and translate that. I have a question for Howie. Mm. Did you did you email anyone and ask if it was for sale? Yes, I did too. <laughs> yeah, I think I think there was a long list of people that that reached out. All of you are each examples of a successful print publication of showing. You know, you're not under corporate ownership. You're showing how it can be done. And so, is there? I mean, maybe this is naive, but. Is it necessary for, was it time for powder to get out from underneath that corporate structure? You know, we're learning in society, maybe we need to break some structures down and build them back up again. And so, and you guys are all kind of successful examples of that. So it sounds like there is a shred of hope that it could come back and maybe be a little more free. I think so. I think there's two, there's two schools of thought. So like, I remember Steve, when you uh, started the rumblings that you were going to move from online to print and everyone i remember just like i think i was actually at powder when it happened i remember like stifford and i being like this is going to be great like we were we were in we wanted to do it that said if i learned tomorrow that you sold the pocket media for 25 million dollars or how you sold your group for whatever like 50 million i wouldn't take yeah, it any less everyone's got their number right well you know what i mean i guess what i'm saying is like in a strange way, I feel like I worked just as hard with Mountain Gazette as I did when I was at Powder under corporate structure. So like the work feels the same, if you will. It's just, I have way less BS to deal with. So like, you know, we just partnered with Flylo and Jackson Hole to give away a four day um, Abby one, right? And I didn't have to go to a lawyer and ask like, oh, what about liability? I was just like, yeah, dude, we're in. We'll promote the hell out of that. Like, we totally want people going in the backcountry being safe. This is a good opportunity, and we just did it, right? Um, so I kind of, you know, I feel like I owe it to my readers to be a certain way, and that's the balance is, like, you owe it to people to keep producing your high-quality content, but also I'm working really, really hard to do this, and I don't know what I would do if someone offered me a large sum of money to buy it because I also have to look out for my own family and everything. So there's a balance between that. I think for powder, yeah, like the second that Stifter took over from Derek, like we wanted to bring Super Park back, misguided or not. We were like, dude, we can do this. And it got shut down immediately. We were like, dude, Tom Wallace never got to experience Super Park. Like we could totally, I mean, that's a, that sells itself but we couldn't do that. So I think if somehow it is able to get underneath that corporate, I don't know what it, you want to even call it. It's like, you don't want to use any like offensive language, but it, I felt like we had to learn really quickly. My first year was not learning what, what made powder tick. It was what made source interlink tick. 
and how I could work within that corporate structure where I, Steve, I feel like you probably, or Howie, do you ever feel like other than like the financial constraints, do you ever feel constrained in what you're able to do and not do? I mean, obviously, right. That's, I think that's it. It's not that we don't have like reservations about pursuing certain stories or like tastes or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying like, I don't know. I feel like I could, I could run anything in Mountain Gazette. I really do. And because of that freedom, it makes it actually a lot, maybe a little more difficult to make something great editorially. Can we I talk about our, can we, let's talk about our readership and our audiences because, sure. you know, my belief that is that um, to do boutique, we're, we're basically boutique publishers, right? So to do boutique publishing, it only happens if you have a strong relationship with your audience. And one of the transitions that we've been making with AJ for the last year and are going to continue to go harder in that position is to make them kind of semi-owners of it, to get them more invested and basically ask them to pay more. And because um, it really, for us to be sustainable long-term, it's going to require that. And for us to give, to give us the freedom to do the kind of things that we ultimately would like to do, we need to have, we need to have their support. But I think that that buy-in from them is really important in, in then having a sense of having a stake. And I think that also puts a different impetus on us as editors in who we are ultimately accountable to. So Harry, I'd be curious to hear your perspective on that. And Ingrid, I'd be curious to hear about you in terms of like your responsibility to your, like your fan base and, you know, as opposed to what you want to do versus that kind of sense of responsibility to them and how much you ask of them. <laughs> That's a really good question. And I do think about it a ton because it's my responsibility to, I take it really seriously to try to keep people safe, um, to try to spread the safety awareness and to try to um, bring more people into skiing, lift people up, make more opportunities. But also you have to balance that. There's the social capital involved. And if you just start preaching or you just start selling stuff from your sponsors, people are gonna they don't listen to that so you really have to balance um, Mike a long time ago you gave a presentation and you said it has to be a two-way conversation you know social media is not like I walk into a bar and just start talking about, to uh, talking about myself it has yeah. to be a conversation you have to give something you have to offer something and it can't just be taking um, so I think that's where a print magazine you can really do that you're really giving people something you're giving them something to hold something to flip through and treasure. Um, and how do you recreate that in a digital form? I don't know. I think the one yeah. bolt on I would, I would add is transparency and vulnerability. And I, and I think Steve, you've done a great job with this um, because you know, the connection you've created and you've been very open about like, Hey, look folks, if you want to continue to get this for the long term, we need to, we need more of you. Please tell your friends. And we've, we've also done that. And I think that kind of communication um, with the reader is, and not, not just the reader, but in our case, the industry, just being extremely transparent about how we're doing things, why we're doing things, and that what they see is real. And I had a falling out, sadly, with, with a certain regime at Powder over this because they weren't playing by that, that church and state kind of ethos that I was raised in frankly. And when, when I, to hear myself say this, I think the only way that you can really be transparent, Mike, back to your point, is when you don't have to go upstairs to get approval to be open and honest with your audience. I guess what I'd ask is for some closing thoughts. I don't think it wraps up at a bow for me, does it for any of you guys? I mean, I don't think that there's a simple... When the pandemic hit, I all of a sudden started craving, you know, before I read books on my Kindle, not whenever I had time, and I read most of my magazine stuff online, and all of a sudden it was like, I want to hold something in my hand and flip through it and get off the screen and resist the temptation to doom scroll or whatever it is. So I, you know, got a, re got a subscription to The New Yorker, and I'm resubscribing to all these magazines that... I did for digitally for so long or just didn't even do because I want the long form stuff. I want to sit down and read. So, you know, there are waves. It comes and goes. And when you're a 16 year old kid, maybe you're not reading books, but maybe you're when you're 25, you will. And I think that's how society works too. And there's waves and it does come back and people realize we're really on the cusp of a huge collective realization that this is not sustainable the way that we consume on screens. And so 
hopefully we can burn it down and start it back up again from the ground and be able to have these amazing stories and these amazing publications and be able to connect in a way that we've sort of lost in the last few years when we focus so much on screens. Well, look, thank you all for taking time out of your lives to chat with me. I think it's just great to talk to you and uh, talk to other creators about the sport we all love. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Be well, everyone. Say goodbye. Bye. Ah, you too. <laughs> all right. See ya. Bye. See ya. Thank you. This episode was brought to you by the Vermont Department of Tourism, reminding you to check and observe the latest travel restrictions at vermontvacation.com. The Backcountry Podcast is produced by Backcountry Magazine, an imprint of Height of Land Publications in Jeffersonville, Vermont. Lucy Higgins is our editor-in-chief. Our intro music was composed by Alex Paul. Bob Rusnock of Bluestream Voice and Imaging engineered this episode. Additional thanks to Tyler Cohen, Betsy Monero, Mike Lorenz, Robin Earl, Paul Davis, Justin Ryer, Michelle Peoples, Holly Howard, Karen Heward, and John Costello. At Backcountry Magazine, our small staff works hard to bring you stories that are thoughtfully edited, beautifully produced, and thoroughly fact-checked. Please consider supporting our independent journalism with a subscription to the magazine. You can subscribe or check out other swag at our website, backcountrymagazine.com. Use promo code PODCAST for 10% off your entire order. I'm Adam Howard. Until next time, I'll see you in the hills. Thanks for listening.